a carol in her heart. The guard came in to take John away. Constance wanted a few more minutes, but she couldn't have them. John asked her for a favor. Could you get my ornaments for me, please? He said, and then he was gone. Constance didn't know if she could do what he asked her. She didn't know if the ornaments were some sort of evidence she wasn't supposed to touch, so she asked the officer if it was all right to return to the house and collect the ornaments, along with the rest of John's things. He smiled and said he'd arranged for someone to take her. On the ride back to the mansion, Constance planned what she would do. First, she checked to see if John's clothes, his flute, and the shepherd's costume were upstairs in his room. Then she'd get his ornament case, place it near the tree, and put the ornaments all back in the antique suitcase that carried them. By the time she'd made these plans and had a few mental reviews for possible problems, the police car pulled into the mansion's driveway. Returning to the house knowing that John wouldn't be there was odd. She wondered if the butler would be bumbling around somewhere. Immediately upon entering, she set out to execute her plan, first going upstairs to see if anything was left in John's room, wherever that was. At the top of the stairs, she saw a hall with several doors, but since only one was open, she thought she'd try there first. On the bed were some things she expected to see, and a few she didn't. John's sweater was there, and his shepherd's clothing, and his flute. But next to the flute was a wig, and a beard, thick glasses, some padding, and the clothes she had seen the butler wear in those few glimpses she'd had of him. She was surprised, but then again, she wasn't that surprised the more she thought about it. Her greatest surprise came when she went downstairs and collected the old Christmas ornament suitcase. When she picked it up to move it closer to the tree, a flap inside the lid fell open, and out spilled several newspaper articles and an envelope. In the envelope was a cashier's check made out to Regional Hospital for $5,000. Not exactly a major endowment, but it was a promised gift nonetheless. Constance wondered where a man like John could have come up with the money. She hoped it wasn't stolen. The newspaper articles were in various shades of aging yellow, but the headlines carried similar themes. One article from the Granville Gazette in December 1969 was cleverly headlined, Deck the Halls with Boughs of Folly. It appears that Santa isn't the only one who sneaks into people's houses to surprise them at Christmas time. Last week in the suburb of... The article went on to explain what the officer had told her. That John borrowed the homes of wealthy people who were away during the holidays and then arranged for a nurse to spend those few days caring for him in exchange for a promised but unspecified gift. Constance didn't like the article because the tone was too facetious. She picked up another one, this one dated December 27, 1964 came from a small town paper in Missouri. Butcher claims con man taught him forgotten carols. A local butcher claims that a mysterious customer taught him Christmas carols about forgotten parts of the Christian holiday. Though the article wasn't about a nurse, Constance recognized unmistakable similarities to what had happened to her. She read article after article in newspapers from all across North America. December 10th, 1951, New York family claims they had their own miracle on 34th Street. Uncle John had really been around. He must have been fairly young when he started doing this, she thought when she read the article from the Des Moines Register of December 1932. Holiday Hope Downtown. With so many out of work this holiday season, many gather at the Main Street Soup Kitchen for food and forgotten carols. Recipients say an elderly out of town are affectionately called Uncle John gives hope to the homeless. The farther back Constance read, the more she marveled that no matter what year the article was written, the depictions of Uncle John were all the same. It would appear he was ageless, but how could he be? One of the articles at the bottom of the pile caught Connie Lou's attention because for some reason it had been preserved in a plastic bag. It was from the Stars and Stripes, dated January 5th, 1943. It read, Remote Mash Unit Not Forgotten. It seems the USO didn't know there was an eccentric entertainer visiting remote units on Christmas Eve with peaceful music and unusual stories. You never expect to meet someone like John in a place like this, said Lieutenant James Preston Chamberlain. Constance paused and read the words out loud to make sure she'd read them correctly, said Lieutenant James Preston Chamberlain. As she heard herself speak her father's name, a strangely familiar warm feeling came over her and she read on. There was something in those forgotten Christmas carols that gave the season a whole new meaning for me. Perhaps it was the magic in the air. She stood up as if she were about to meet someone for the first time, though no one was there. She held the newspaper article with the tenderness reserved for very precious things. As she did, she imagined her father's face, only known to her through pictures, 
reacting to each of John's carols. She wished she could have been there, seen them together, listened to them talk. She wondered if her father spoke to John of the child his wife was carrying and what her name might be. The more she thought about the connection between her father and Uncle John, the more she realized that this Christmas was not an accident. It was a gift. Constance carefully returned the articles to their special compartment in the suitcase and reported to the officer who was on the phone in the other room about the cashier's check to the hospital. Then she proceeded to take the ornaments off the tree. As she held each one, she was enveloped in the memories and the melodies that accompanied them. She rediscovered the significance and meaning of each one. The star, the cradle, the bow made of swaddling clothes, the corsage of dried flowers, the composer's pen, the shepherd's flute, the entrance to the inn. All filled her heart again as she laid them in their appointed places in the leather and wood case. There wasn't a place for the newest ornament in the collection, the Red Cross, and no melody came quickly to her mind as she held it. But one was there, buried in her heart, and without her knowing how it happened, suddenly it was set free. Season to last all 
As she sang, she also danced with a partner who wasn't there. Had anyone been watching, they'd have noticed every gesture, every glance, every moment made it clear that whoever she was remembering was someone very special. She could hardly finish the song for her tears. She'd never cried tears like that before. They were cleansing tears that carried a lifetime of unexpressed feelings. They were tears of love lost and love found. They were tears of understanding of all she had missed and tears of gratitude for all she could now receive. When she had cried them all out, she felt reborn. Oh, how she wished that John could have heard her carol, the one he had told her she was writing in her heart. Of all the people in the world, he was the one she wanted most to share it with. Perhaps I'll have that chance when I return the ornaments, she thought. Not knowing whether to keep her red cross or place it in the case, she decided at length to place it with the other ornaments. She felt that it would be a unique honor to have something of herself in such company.